Hi, this is Long. Welcome to our video series on search patterns for the most common studies in radiology. Please note that this is an introduction to study interpretation. An enormous amount of detail is omitted for brevity. Continue dedicated reading, seeing as many cases as possible, and keep getting feedback from subspecialists during the course of your training. Today we're going to talk about a basic approach to an FDG PET CT. Um, this sort of study is frequently done for oncologic staging and treatment response. In some cases, it will be used to track infectious and inflammatory etiologies. Specialized sorts of this type of exam will be used for neurodegenerative processes or centered on the heart to assess for uh, primary cardio, uh, cardiovascular abnormalities or hybriding myocardium, sarcoid, other specific um, processes. This video is going to be focused on a PET CT either of the whole body or between the eyes and thighs, as we like to say, um, to evaluate primarily for an oncologic process to track uh, you know, a patient with known underlying neoplasm. The kind of major ideas surrounding the use of this, uh, exam is that you have the PET images, you know, the PET only, the fused PET and CT, and then the CT only images. The CT images are generally not of diagnostic quality in the same way if you have just a uh, CT by itself, but it's essential to go through each set of images and correlate between them as well as for the priors in the clinical setting to understand what's going on. Having a good sense of what's happening with the patient in the clinical, con clinical context will help you avoid misinterpreting false positives when we see FDG uptake um, and, missing, and and thinking that's uh, a neoplastic process when it could be something else, uh, as FDG uptake is not always specific um, to any one particular process. So in terms of a larger overall approach, first we're going to take a look at the history and indications and understand what's going on with the patient. And then we'll assess the study in the context of the patient receiving the radio tracer to understand any potential limitations. Ultimately, then, when we first start the study, it's good practice to do reference comparison, you know, reference values of FDG uptake, which are frequently done at the liver and of the blood pool, such as at the aorta. And it's useful, especially for a prior exam, to a to compare these reference values as subtle, you know, small differences or variations in FDG uptake between studies could be uh, an artifact of differential, you know, overall uptake in the study related to the setting of the patient or the injection. So we'll do that first. And then the process I typically like to take is to first look at the PET only images, frequently the 3D MIPS, going through looking at 2D projections, and then correlating those with the fused images um, as we go through the anatomy, and then going through and doing like a full search on the attenuation correction CT images. I'll rely a lot on knowledge of uh, search patterns uh, for each parts of the anatomy and kind of go through this in a large big picture sort of way, especially as PET CT can be a particularly involved um, and very complicated study. So we'll touch her mostly on big picture concepts and the overall outline of such an approach. Okay, so here is one way to lay out a uh, PET CT sort of study. And if we are open up to the study, uh, we, we want to get a sense, you know, we've got here kind of rotating 3D MIPS. I've got two D different projections in axial, coronal, and sagittal images, both of just the PET images. And these are the attenuation corrected images. Um, we are also pro provided the non attenuation non-attenuation uh, corrected images in the jacket, we, which we could look at specifically. Um, and then there are additionally fused images, which I will bring up separately as we need them. Okay, so this is what this is what the fused images look like, combining both the CT uh, attenuation uh, correction images and the PET uh, information. So in patients with uh, an oncologic history, you want to get a good sense as to what the patient primary tumors the patient has, if, uh, these, are, if these are known, and get a sense of all um, kind of history up to this point, prior surgeries, histologic findings, or and even things such as results of prior surgeries, if there were positive margins, where these surgical sites were, and be aware of if the patient is on chemotherapy or immunotherapy regimens, um, anything current, any prior ones, this can affect the change in any sort of findings over time. Um, if the patient has previous, um, you know, uh, kind of like interventional oncology procedures, uh, um, 
radiotherapy, all of these can affect the appearance of disease. And so having that context is going to be really important to understanding um, what you're seeing in each, in each of these studies. When you're looking for these prior, when uh, evaluating patients for oncologic processes, those are the sorts of things in mind. These sorts of studies will also be done in some scenarios where you're looking for a site of infection, like fe fever of unknown origin. And you want to have a sense as to, the, you know, a, a, cer a certain degree of clinical suspicion for where the infection may be arising from. Um, these sorts of things can be particularly useful, uh, especially in optimizing the patient. For example, if the patient has an infectious etiology suspected near the heart, you might want to put the patient on a cardiac diet to suppress myocardial uptake to be able to pick, out, pick up uh, a potential focus of FDG, FDG avidity um, that's close to the myocardium. One thing to keep in mind as we go through this sort of study is that FDG uptake is not entirely specific. It can be seen with infectious inflammatory, traumatic, or neoplastic processes. And then you want to just, you know, not default into that thinking that any sort of thing you see immediately um, is a neoplastic process. So when we first start the exam, you want to get a sense of uh, if there's any uh, if there's any issue with the injection, you want to have to have the patient fasting for four to six hours. And you want to check also that the glucose has, you know, is measured around 150, you know, less than 150 to 220 with increasing levels of blood sugar uh, being can, can limit the exam. Um, and we want to make sure that these images were obtained, you know, about, you know, 45 to 60 minutes after injection. You want, as we take a look at the exam overall, you also want to get a sense if there's a diffuse muscle uptake, if there is, you know, any sense of brown fat uptake. Um, you want to see, you know, here we don't necessarily image the entirety of the brain, but as we, if you take a look um, for, at the brain uptake, if we have any decreased brain uptake, you may want to. Um, you suspect that there's an incorrect SUV calculation prior to um, the, the the layout of this study. Uh, if if we are seeing, um, you know, uh, abnormal fat uptake within the within um, kind of the the neck and back and and along the mediastinum, that would make us suspicious for brown fat uptake. One of the things you may do is provide warming or benzodiazepines that we, you know, which is a way of preventing that. Um, on the front end. So first things we'll, we'll do in approaching the study and laying out, um, and many people have different sort of preferences in laying these out, is to get a measurement of, th you know, a 3D uh, measurement of the SUV content, you know, in the liver um, and getting, a, you know, in, in some institutions or in some practice settings, you'll report the mean or the, the SUV max um, there, as well as in the region of the ascending aorta for the blood pool and you and then once you have a sense of how those values compare to prior and have a sense of what's been going on in the prior we can go through it and look at the pet images um, uh, one by one and so one one way to start to get an overall sense of any potential abnormality is to look at the 3d maps to get just an overall uh, sense of the, the layout of any potential disease going through and looking at the head and neck um, uh, the chest and just going from a top-down approach uh, and essentially looking also at liver bowel other visceral structures the osseous structures, soft tissues, getting a sense as if there's any abnormal uptake uh, compared to where you expect normal uptake on FTG PET. Another useful approach will be then to go through, and one of the things I like to do is actually use the coronal 2D MIPS, and we can make these thinner or thicker. And go through again in a systematic approach through the head and neck, and chest, mediastinum, and then go through and basically all of the major structures of the chest, abdomen, pelvis. And we can do this on multiple projections, um, kind of following, using this, a similar overall search pattern as you might use for CT exams um, and following that all the way through the anatomy and then looking for any abnormal uptake. And then when we do uh, find anything that is uh, FDG avid, we can correlate um, with the CT attenuation um, images to get a sense of anatomic localization, as well as going through the fused images to 
get a sense as to where it is in the patient anatomy. It's essential to remember that on PET, you may have to use different windows um, at different parts of the patient anatomy to detect abnormal uptake. Differing proje projections will be helpful, such as the coronal reconstructions are particularly useful for the osseous pelvis, uh, the femurs, and then the coronal, uh, the sagittal reconstruction can be particularly useful for uh, the spine, uh, areas at the skull base, the clivus, sacrum. And then these can be also correlated back to the 3D MIPS and the fused images as needed. As you go through the whole of the patient anatomy on the pet only, you can repeat that on the fused images um, if, or correlate between the two of them. And then once you're done going through the pet only and fused images, you'll have to do a complete search pattern on the CT images performed for attenuation correction. Um, there will be many instances where there will be non-FDG avid, you know, abnormality that you'll detect just on, just on the CT images. So you'll go through the visualized intracranial compartment, head and neck structures, chest, and then abdomen and pelvis in the usual fashion as you would for uh, a CT, each of those structures and then through the visualized upper and lower extremities, especially for times where you have a PET CT of the entire body, uh, including the upper and lower extremities, you're gonna wanna go systematically through each of those uh, compartments and look for both abnormal hypermetabolism as well as abnormalities seen just on the, the CT images. After you've delineated any abnormalities on the various sets of images, PET only, fused, and, on, and CT images only, you're going to want to make sure you compare each of those across the different sets of images and then to the prior study in the context of the, of the patient presentation. To broadly recap, in terms of approaching a PET CT, it's essential to get a sense of what's going on with the patient and where any potential abnormality is suspected, especially in the setting of any recurrent disease or a focus of infection. It's essential to understand the limitations that dictate whether or not you will get differences in FCV measurements in hypermetabolism between one study and the next. Measuring the reference values and comparing them from study to study will give you a sense of overall uptake that is technical in etiology. And then it's essential to go through the entirety of the patient anatomy on each of the provided sets of images, the PET only, um, and using the attenuation corrected images and comparing as needed to the non-attenuation uh, corrected images. You'll also then go through the fused in correlation with the PET only images, and then finally do a full search through the entirety of the patient anatomy on the CT images.